Welcome to the Reading Room. Today we have Lisa Lynn Kanai. She's an award-winning author, recipient of the Cades Award for Literature, and she's the author of two books. Uh, one book is Islands Linked by Ocean, a short story collection. The other book is basically a chapbook uh, called Sister Tongue. <laughs> And uh, she also um, has been anthologized widely, and she is an instructor. Um, she teaches composition and literature at uh, Kafiolani Community College, and she's the chair of their LLL uh, department. Uh, welcome, Lisa Lynn Kanai. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Anne. <laughs> Uh, I have, um, I noticed that your short stories and your poems have this really authentic voice. I love your voice and a lot of your readers do. Um, and a lot of people say that it's mainly a, you know, a Hawaii voice. They can really relate to it. Um, they recognize the language and uh, they relate to the characters and the place, right? The settings uh, in your work. How would you describe your work and what do you write about for, for someone who wasn't familiar with your work? Hmm, I would probably describe my work as coming from Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's an authentic voice, it's because I rely on the voices that I've grown up oh, with. Yeah. I don't necessarily want to be able to categorize myself mm -hmm. as a writer of Hawaii. Oh, yeah. I, th I think what happens is the, the work and the readers do that categorizing for oh, me. True, and true. I'm just, I'm very proud of that and honored oh, by that. The other question was... Oh, yeah. Uh, what do you usually write about in oh, your poems. work? Yeah. Yeah, I write about here. You know, oh. I, uh, I've been able to travel mm -hmm. a lot, and um, I'll, I'll write about places I've been, mm -hmm. usually mm -hmm. essays, but they take on the tone of mm -hmm. observation that are, you know, oh, observation yeah. writing. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. never really... I'm, mm -hmm. I'm an outsider looking in. Oh, but see. when it comes down to the, the short stories and the poems, oh. they're usually about... Um, about my place here, oh. and it's usually Waikiki, the Waikiki area, yeah. or the Kapuhu area where oh. I'm from, and oh. still call home. Oh, I love how you mentioned the word home, you know, and the <laughs> meaning of home to you. It's so amazing. <clears throat> Oh, there are a lot of memorable stories uh, from your book of short stories, Island Links by Ocean, and also your chapbook, Sister Tongue, and in a lot of your anthologies. Uh, if you were to pick, what would be your favorite story or poem, and why would that piece of work be your favorite? From the, from the short story collection, I actually thought about it. There's, there's two stories that I'm really fond of, mm. and one of them is the story titled... Um, swift blur of passing vehicles and the reason why I'm really fond of that is because it's a third person point of view story from the point of view of the father so the story is basically about a father and son who are struggling to cope with having been left by the mom in that family and how that father and son have to he's a teenage boy and they they have to repair not only their relationship, but it, mm -hmm. they have to be able to cope with not having um, mm -hmm. the mother there. So the story opens with the boy, and he, uh, he finds an abandoned pit bull mm -hmm. near a dumpster yeah. um, in Makiki. Oh. And the reason why I love the story so much is because um, I had no idea who these two characters are. Usually if you write a short story, mm -hmm. you create a character maybe based on someone you know mm -hmm. or... Um, may, or based on an experience that you've had. But these two characters are total strangers to me. And um, they sort of showed up during the process. It started with me walking my dog mm -hmm. around Makiki. Mm -hmm. And I ended up at this street where the uh, highway was on this side mm -hmm. and the houses were on this side. And then there was this chain link fence. And I just stopped and asked myself, wow, what is it like living so close to the, you know, close to the freeway? Yeah. So I would go back every day. And every day it was different because if mm -hmm. there was uh, traffic, mm -hmm. um, it was quiet because the cars aren't moving. But if there was no traffic, then all you heard were um, cars mm -hmm. zooming by. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't what I expected. So it was from that simple experience that mm -hmm. I tried to write this story. And the, what's nice about the story for me anyway is I think when you... And I know you're a writer. Oh, I know yeah. when you um, start a story and it 
the mystery sort of unfolds for you, mm -hmm. it's the process that is a lot of fun. Not necessarily the end product, oh. but the process. Oh. <laughs> the process keeps you hooked. Oh, and um, so I'm trying to write to figure out well, what's going to happen to these two, you know. Oh, yeah. And that's why. Um, and I love this father and son, and I don't. Oh. I just have. The, um, I just have this, this uh, real deep um, mm -hmm. sort of attachment to them, and it, oh, I want yeah. what's best for them. And mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think when you create characters, you have to have that kind of um, concern for them, or else oh, yeah. your reader won't. Oh, so that's one story. Mm -hmm. And the other one, of course, is the title story of the book, oh. Islands Linked by Ocean, mm -hmm. because that's the only true story in the oh. book. It's more of a creative nonfiction piece oh, about it. my father. Oh, man. You know, I, I love how all of these um, ideas that you're, you're bringing out in terms of the craft of writing and, and you know, basically a lot of uh, my students for creative writing class, they really love your work, you know, oh, and, you know, even you. My, my 100 students and they really relate and connect <clears throat> to your work. And I love how you talk about, you know, how you got that idea and about the dog and, you know, seeing, um, it's just amazing. <laughs> it's just, we just no, love if it. I could tell your students. <laughs> I could oh, tell your students well, one thing about finding yeah. a story is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. go walk around and, and oh, open your man. eyes and oh, your ears, you know, so because mm -hmm. it's the environment that'll, you know, oh, that'll mm -hmm, inform mm -hmm. the story. Oh, man, good advice. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, if you don't mind, would it be possible for you to read some of your work? We would really appreciate it. I would really appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, I'll read uh, just this excerpt from Islands Linked by Ocean, the story about my dad. Only because this is a really, uh, mm. it's a special story. Mm. It's kind of a, um, well, it's a, it's a family, Mo'olelo. Mm. So it's a, fa it's a story that, um, it's a story I actually tell my students in the beginning of the semester mm -hmm. that um, someday, or maybe you've already experienced, I'll tell them that they'll come along and experience in a story in your life that'll actually um, help you mm. with who you are mm. and further your identity yeah. and give you purpose. And I, I, you know, it's my father, um, when he was dying of, of oh. he, colon cancer near mm -hmm. the end, mm -hmm. I went to visit him in Las Vegas. And yeah. uh, my only way of coping with what was going on was to write about mm -hmm. what I saw there. And mm -hmm. while I had no intention of turning it into something yeah. for publication, mm -hmm. um, it was the writing that really helped oh. me figure out how to cope with this. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if it, it helped me um, create kind of what they call like a psychic distance oh. so that you can observe what's happening. Mm -hmm. And then I remembered this story he used to tell us as a kid yeah. so many times. Mm -hmm. He told us this story so many times we would roll our eyes when oh. he tried to tell it again. <laughs> yeah. you know? so, and um, it wasn't until I, uh, five years later, mm -hmm. when I went to craft this piece, mm -hmm. it's when I recalled the story about the red fish and it, it, it made so much sense oh, to me. It was, a, it was yeah. a gift. Ooh. So um, it's just an excerpt. This part of the story is called um, The Bread Man. Mm -hmm. oh. So, when I was a child, my father woke up at 4 a.m. every Monday through Friday to put on his orange wholesome shirt. Mm. He drove a tall white delivery truck painted with orange stars hovering over an open wholesome bag, revealing slices of white bread that seemed to perpetually tumble mm. from the sky. My father delivered bread for a living, but he was more than just a bread man. He could bowl a perfect 300 game, mm -hmm. play the ukulele, croon like Dean Martin, and tell more tall tales than his bread truck had bread. Dad could tell a story with so much convincing charm, I hadn't realized that half of what he said was baloney. Once when I was six years old, he told me, no tell nobody, but your mother is 10 years older than me. When I discovered that mom was 10 years younger than my father, I knew I couldn't believe everything he said. But he told one story that has captivated me to this day, a story he told so many times that with each telling, it grew more fantastic. The story begins on a morning when the sky was still dark. Daybreak was about an hour away. Dad drove his delivery truck from Hanauma Bay Lookout Point 
down the steep one-eighth of a mile incline that leads to the concession stand. He parked his truck and unloaded a few slats of hot dog and hamburger buns. Mm. I imagine that aside from the ocean, all he heard was the swoosh and thunk of the van's door sliding open, mm. then locking in place. He carried the slats to the concession stand counter where he found, on top of a picnic table, a fish. His first reaction, look for the owner of that fish. No one was there. He left the slats on the counter so he could examine the fish but next to it were two quarters. Mm -hmm. He said he wasn't sure why, but he took off his shoes, picked up the fish, walked to the shoreline, and slid the fish into the ocean. He walked back to the concession stand, unloaded the slat of buns on the counter, and returned to the van, leaving the two quarters on the picnic table. Mm -hmm. The next morning, when he made his delivery to Hanoma Bay, there in the same spot on the picnic table lay two quarters. He was baffled but he slid the coins in his pocket and left Hanoma Bay. Oh, I love that story. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's so, you know, I, I noticed, like, with that story about your dad, you know, I, I love the details, you know, the wholesome bread man, you know. Yeah. It's so, so, and I love the way you tell a story, you know. There's so many details, and it's, it's so real, you know. And I know um, there are a lot of comments, you know, from my students and other authors, you know, about how real your work is, you know, just because of the details and the voice, basically. I love the pigeon as well. It's so, so rich. <laughs> um, for you also have the short story, The Steersman, and it talks about canoe paddlers and uh, Sister Tongue includes um, personal experiences as well. How do you deal with exposing yourself to your work? Um, are there topics that you would not write about? How do I deal with myself, exposing myself through yeah. my work? I don't um, have a, necessarily have a problem exposing oh. myself through my work mm. um, because if the story, I don't know. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I'm sure they'll edit that one out. Um, I don't really have a problem exposing myself to the work. I, mm -hmm. I think um, a lot of the time, if the character, if it's a first-person narrative, mm -hmm. and if it comes from me, you know, the character will have a mm. name. Yeah. And, and then from there, I can shape the character to be mm -hmm. her own person. Sure, sure. Um, and the other question was... Oh, yeah. Uh, are there topics you wouldn't, would not write about? You know, I, I could tell you no. Oh, Although, yeah. um, I think as writers, mm -hmm. we have a responsibility. You, yeah. you know, thank you for all the compliments about how powerful oh. the work is. <laughs> it is. And so, which is why we have a responsibility because oh, yeah. we work so hard at this craft mm -hmm. that we affect people with what we write. That's true. So we do have responsibility mm -hmm. to... Um, tell a truth mm -hmm. and um, we have a responsibility maybe uh, to lend authenticity to what wow. we're trying to say and what we're trying to do. Yeah. If anybody was off limits it would probably be yeah. um, my husband. Oh. I mm -hmm. don't feel that mm -hmm. um, I would want to exploit oh, I uh, see. someone yeah. like that that sure. way. Yeah. Um, and if I, if I do write about family or if I do write about friends, mm -hmm. then they certainly um, oh. get a peek at it first. Oh. <laughs> For the Steersman is, sure. act, is a story oh. about um, the first time I crossed the Molokai Channel oh. in Navahini Okekai. And our coach, oh. um, <laughs> our coach would yell at us <laughs> and he was just, he was so mean <laughs> and... Uh, and it, it was really his attempt to not only toughen us up, but I think it was his way of making us do even more than we thought we could. Wow. And of mm. course, you don't realize it while you're getting yelled at. Oh, yeah. But um, I had to write a story about him because he's such a character, you oh, know? Yeah. And so mm. um, I wrote it uh, after I did the race. I wanted to say mahalo for that experience. It was probably more spiritual than anything else. Oh, and I, wow. I told him, bro, take a look at this. <laughs> and he looked at it and he goes, is this what I sound like? And I said, yeah, that's what you sound like. Wow. And um, he, he, um, he loved it because in the end, the, the story does what it's supposed to do. And it, it, oh. it really um, honors him and props him up to, yeah. be, mm -hmm. to be quite the, um, 
to be quite the coach and quite the Hawaiian. Oh, nice. So I was really, nice. um, um, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, if, if I, if anything's off limits, mm. it would probably be, um, yeah, the, oh, some of the people I'm really close to. Sure, I certainly sure. don't want to exploit anyone. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. It's but just so good. No, I don't think any writer should feel that any topic is off limits. Oh, good. Good points. Wow. Oh. Um, I know we talked about writing a lot, <laughs> usually in your car <laughs> or like, you know, when we have lunch together or, you know, the writing, the topic comes up, That's you know, fun to talk about writing, yeah, writing, yeah, writing somebody writes. <laughs> yeah, it's like long talks, you know, yeah. <laughs> so I was wondering, um, okay, well, describe your, um, I know everyone has their own writing process. What, what, what would be your writing process? Oh, I, you know, I get asked this question a lot yeah. and, um, it's always the same answer. Um, There's never one process. I think every story I've written mm -hmm. has begun, uh, has come to me or begun in a different way yeah. because it's either through uh, a phrase that you latch onto oh. or an image you latch onto yeah. or uh, a personality oh. or just the way somebody, a gesture. Um, I think one of the things, if I were to tell your students, mm -hmm. you know, you want to write, yeah. yeah. Um, the first thing you got to do is, uh, disappear in the background and just observe oh. because mm. you have to have eyes like a writer now oh. so you have to walk around in the world and, and look mm, at the world sure. and observe oh, so yeah. the process really is about mm. being observant mm -hmm. and not necessarily critical but oh. to sort of take things uh, the way they are oh. like one example is I was standing in line at, at mm. the Children's Museum once and this mm. woman in front of me said something that I, you know, I just, mm -hmm. I couldn't, she said uh, she was getting bitten by mosquitoes because, oh. um, because local people don't get bitten by oh. mosquitoes. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it's like, wow. So, <laughs> yeah, I said, thank you for that one because I think I can use it. Wow. <laughs> it was just such an off-the-cuff remark. Yeah. So that's my point, right? My point oh. is to pay attention. Yeah, so the process is interesting. Sometimes I'll outline something. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Sometimes I just as a challenge to myself mm. because writing is can be very solitary, mm, yeah, and you yeah. just go a little bananas sometimes. But so you make these little challenges for yourself. Oh, okay. So maybe another challenge would be to not have any kind of plan whatsoever oh. and to let the story build upon itself, wow. uh, like uh, organically. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and. Sometimes I just start with an ending. I'll know the ending, and then oh my, I gotta go walk work oh. backwards now. Yeah, but it's never the same. Oh, yeah. So good. yeah, but as long as you get that draft down on, on a piece of paper. Man. Oh, but the I, best part, of course, is <laughs> revising that draft, right? Yeah. So that's the best part, right? Oh, my gosh. That's such good advice because I know, like, a lot of students, they feel like it's one way or, like, why isn't this working or, you know, so I, I'm so glad, you know, just by you, you, you mentioning your process and how it's different, it allows them to be free and just kind of um, have oh. their own creative process. So it's, wow, great, great advice. All right, so uh, something related to it. So no matter how talented a writer is, uh, there's um, always that chance of writer's block. <laughs> and then so a lot of people talk about writer's block, right? Um, now, what is your cure or your take on writer's block? <laughs> <laughs> writer's block. Um, I don't think there's such a thing as writer's block. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a... Um, mm -hmm. I think it's an excuse, oh, oh. but I also feel it. It has everything to do with fear. Yeah, because mm -hmm. that you know, I mean, you know this, right? That blank. Oh yeah. Computer screen. <laughs> yeah, oh, like, that's no. a long journey to start. And <laughs> yeah. it's, it's even it's just a couple of sentences. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. So when you start, and oh. when you're on a clip, whoa, it's just. Um, and that's why we do it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there is such a thing as writer's block. I know there are tons of books written about writer's block. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of people say, oh, I'm suffering from writer's block. Oh, Students say it a lot. Yeah. But I don't think there's such a thing as writer's block. I think it's, um, mm -hmm. I think it's fear. Yeah. Like, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do I do? Because <laughs> I get scared too. Um, uh, you know, Lois Ann Yamanaka gave me the best advice yeah, for this. Yeah. She said, go to Ala Moana. She oh. said, go to Ala Moana, sit down and watch, and just watch people. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. and something will, you know, something will come. Oh, I think, uh, you know, 
when you first start writing, um, like you said, you, you know, you think that first story is going to be, uh, it's going to win the Pulitzer or something, <laughs> and you know, it's going mm. to be crap. You have to face the fact that it's not going to be very good. Oh, sure. And it just takes sure. a long time. Yeah. So that's fear. Yeah. And um, so she said, go to Ala Moana, sit down, and just watch oh, people. You know, enjoy sweet. that. Because there's somebody walking around that's going to catch your eye. You have to be observant. Or someone's going to say something. Sure, be sure. observant. Or you'll see something in a shop. Wow. Just be observant. There's a story in everything, you know. Oh, that's so inspiring, yeah, you know. Yeah, it is. They're, they're it's trying like to write it's everywhere, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Oh, man. You see it in students, too, you know, when they latch oh, on to yeah. something and they, mm -hmm. they're so excited. And they want to talk about it. Oh, no, don't talk about it. Write about it. <laughs> so good yeah <laughs> that's true man and it's so so good coming from you where you understand that fear you know so even like you know all writers experience that and mm -hmm. oh man that's yeah so will i ever be able to write anything again? <laughs> scary oh yeah i man. don't know why it's scary why do you think it's scary gosh yeah i don't know it's just like, it's funny though yeah like everyone thinks that way yeah it's yeah. like oh, what maybe your computer one? screen should be a different color or something <laughs> maybe <white>. yeah <laughs> it's like i don't know we're it's all scary like, but yeah <laughs> it is <laughs> Oh man, good advice. Um, okay, so another question. Uh, you're well, award-winning author, right? <laughs> and the thing is, honestly, a lot of people appreciate your work, you know, and they discuss it in classrooms, right? Um, now, think of a time, and I know you've um, answered this, um, but think of a time before all of these publications. And you're so humble. You always think like that, <laughs> you know. But like before all of the accolades and then all the publications, and you, what advice would you have for someone who wants to be a writer, you know, but they're just starting, nothing published yet, you know, nothing at all. What advice would you have for that person? Read. Oh, yeah. Read. Um, mm -hmm. So I have an MA in creative writing from the University <laughs> yes. of Hawaii. And um, some of the best teachers were actually, I mean, I, I met a lot of great people mm -hmm. there. But the, um, the best advice I ever got was to mm -hmm. uh, find your mm -hmm. kumu in a book. So what you want to do is you mm -hmm. want a student who wants to be a writer, oh. <laughs> go um, yeah. find someone you want to... Um, mm -hmm. Maybe not emulate, but who do you, you know, read? Mm, and the, the yeah. thing about writers, yeah. people who want to write, yeah. is for the most part, they've got really good taste. Oh, you know, they, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, they do. Um, they, do. they know cliche when they see oh, it, yeah. they yeah. know uh, genre stuff when they mm -hmm. see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, not, not, I don't want to mm. be snobbish or anything mm. like that, but if they decide what, what they really enjoy reading mm. and they should latch on it, then they should read a lot of it. And I think, True. you know, I never thought I would be, uh, well, I always wrote, mm -hmm. but I never thought you could get a degree doing it. <laughs> but, um, so, but I always, I think the first and foremost was, was reading. Oh, yeah. I remember um, just uh, loving to read so much and thinking, mm -hmm. um, it's like, you know, you hold something like this. <laughs> yeah. Now that there's iPads, it's different, but <laughs> yeah. you hold something like this, and mm. there's just a whole world in there. Yeah. And um, you have to go find the writer who gives you the world that you enjoy oh, seeing and, um, and learn from the writer. Oh, so God. unfortunately, you're not just going to read passively for enjoyment anymore. Oh. You're going to look for craft. Yes, yes. For instance, how did that, how did that writer handle a flashback? Oh, yeah. You know, how did Good. that writer handle a flashback? seamlessly uh, yeah. go from like the present story to a time in the past for that character oh, um, just learning how to do that artfully mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. seamlessly yeah, yeah these the people oh. in the who've done it are your best teachers oh. yeah so you read a lot mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, I think um, I've said it so many times before uh, mm -hmm. You, what you're going to end up doing, of course, you, I shouldn't use a second person point of view, you, but <laughs> what I did was I, then I started copying, you know, oh, voices. Yeah. I mean, I, I wrote stories with characters with Southern accents, you know, oh, and I'd yeah. never even been to the South back oh. then. So, mm -mm -mm. Um, but that's good. It's like homage, <laughs> uh, but you're learning yeah. and, um, mm. and then, right. The other piece of advice is that mm. I remember when the first time I picked up a book 
Oh, the first time I learned about Hawaii literature, mm. I think affectionately called local literature, was um, in a in a um, um, a senior women's literature course. Oh, mm. and I was a senior in college, oh. and I was an unconventional oh. college student, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so I was a little <laughs> older, um, but. I'd never read anything by a Hawaii writer oh. until that class. Oh. And it occurred to me that I have so many stories to tell yeah. now. Oh. So the other piece of advice is, yes. yeah, write down those stories. Oh. Just write. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's oh. easier said than done. Uh -huh. But find that group of fellow crazy oh. people who love to write <laughs> and, um, yeah. and, and form, uh, form relationships with them mm. so that and it has to be people you trust. Yes. Yes. And and you and you have to be just as generous mm -hmm. to them mm -hmm. as they are to you. Wow. Yeah? yeah, there's nothing like having somebody call you in the middle of the night. And go, <laughs> I just sent you something. Can you read it? Can you tell me if you like it or not? Uh, and I'll read it. Wow. So right, that's what yeah, friends do. And I think true. when you surround yourself with people who have the same passion that you do, yeah. you oh. nothing will hold you back. Wow. Yeah. yeah so true. It's so you true. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. wow. Thanks. Makes me happy when I see a student who. Yeah is really in, into um, mm -hmm. finding the right words, oh, you know, they pay attention. So. so good. And it, it's so important to have, you know, um, writers that the students can relate to and they really relate to you, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> they do. And it's so, they, they just, they see themselves a lot of time in your work and it's, you can tell it's so important to them, you know, and just, Well, I, I think so I experienced good. the same thing when, oh. um, mm -hmm. when I, picked yeah. up a book written by someone from here wow. and it wasn't you know um mm -hmm. a tourism brochure or something like that it was oh. about local people with mm -hmm. in real local life and oh. it was uh so validating i don't know why to see ourselves in in books yeah and yeah. um maybe it's because all our lives we've mm -hmm. been um made to read yeah. uh mm -hmm. books from either the continent or Europe, yeah. which is great literature. <laughs> yeah, it All is. All literature is good. <laughs> but uh, to be able to see our, you know, mm. uh, my street name in a book. Oh yeah. Like, well, I guess I exist, you know. Wow. So, mm -hmm. um, if students feel that way about my work, then thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I. That's that's an honor. Oh. Well, thank you for writing all of that. <laughs> Appreciate you, you know. Oh, and speaking of writing and your work, oh, it would be so great. Well, would you mind like reading another um, selection? <laughs> we would be really appreciative. <laughs> I just want to say for the record, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, You're really helping oh, uh, Hawaii you. writers. Oh, and it's man. just so important to have a document of oh. all of the work that we do. Oh, well, thanks for participating yeah. and coming. So um, I think I'll read. It's, um, I'm working on, mm. been working on it for a while, uh, maybe a longer piece. I, I'm a I don't know if I want to call it a novel yet, about um, a character who uh, grows up in Waikiki. I have an affinity for Waikiki because mm. I grew up on Ka Kapahulu Avenue yeah. and I was just a beach girl and, uh, <laughs> and not very good in school. I'm paying a karmic debt now. <laughs> but um, I have so many um, memories of, mm -hmm. of growing up there. Mm. So I have this character yeah. and of course she is living in Waikiki um, and just trying to, local girl, trying to, you mm -hmm. know, try to find her place in the world. So the place is called, uh, the piece is called Bobby Pin. Oh. And it really is, and I, I, I admit this to people, to, to readers and, and students, that mm. this was actually an attempt to workshop a character. In other words, oh. I'm trying to get to know the character. Oh. So sometimes when I tell students, you know, you got to know your character. You got to develop that character yeah. before you even put that character in a story. Wow. Who is this person? Because mm -hmm. you have to know the person before you put them through all this stuff you're going to put <laughs> them through in a story. So, yeah. um, so then they're like, well, how do you do that? And I go, well, just try listen to them for a minute. Let, you know, just try listen to them. Shut up and listen to them. <laughs> and then sit down and write what happens to oh. them. Just write anything. And that's, of course, it's like building a relationship with anybody. Um, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. listen to them and you get wow. to know them and then you figure out what kind of conflict you're going to put them into oh, in your story. So man. it's called Bobby Pin. Wow, thanks. And it's in Pigeon. Oh, yes, yes. So, <laughs> all us girls at the Lewis Street McDonald's get one small Tupperware container full with Bobby Pins. 
You cannot have enough bobby pins. This McDonald's is probably the busiest one in Hawaii. So once you punch in and hit the floor, you cannot be fixing your hair. You know more even time for stop and check out what you look like. Not like get plenty of mirrors behind the counter anyway. The mirror only get, the only mirror get is the one inside the French fry warmer. So maybe if you get a couple seconds, you can check out your face when you're scooping fries in the cartons. Remember now, I said couple seconds. I don't know why they call that thing a French fry warmer because the thing is not warm, okay, it's hot. Get those orange heating lights too, the kind that make your face look like one jack-o'-lantern. And you can forget about seeing your reflection in the stainless steel equipment. Basically, you better do all that make pretty, pretty stuff before you grab your time card. Remember, this is Waikiki. We're supposed to be pretty. So this is my routine. I pull back my hair into one ponytail, and then with my fingers, pick at my bangs so they drape naturally over my forehead. I get what Tutu call one, high forehead. She get one too, but she no can cut her hair because she one hula dancer. She almost had one hot attack when I cut my bangs, but I told her times are different, Tutu. I liberated. I free for do what I like, like spray Aquanet on my bangs. I gotta shut my eyes and hold my breath because Aquanet is stink and can sting. I slick back any loose strands and then slide in some bobby pins for keep everything all neat, all together. Your hair cannot be hanging in front of your face health regulations. Mamata's boyfriend tell me that rule is stupid because I come home smelling like cooking oil and burnt salt. He said, I might as well sell chemotherapy on the side. One time he told me, every day Yamada carry huge trays of dinner plates at the Sheraton. All you do is push hamburgers. Whatever, I don't listen to him. When I bring home leftovers, he the first one for grab the quarter pounder. He's nothing but a broke-ass bum anyway. At least I get one job. Mm -hmm. Every couple weeks, I go Woolworths for buy my hair nets. Buy the black, nylon kind. No buy honeycomb. The color look like peach fuzz on your head. So this is how you put on one hair net. You grab the elastic rim with both hands and spread your fingers for hold the rim open like that string game you play when you were a kid. And then slide the net over your head like one shower cap. Underneath the hair net, my ponytail looked like one fish inside one fish net. Us girls have to wear one flat orange aloha print bow on our heads mm. too. The bow match my aloha shirt uniform, which by the way is so big for me, I look like I stay six years old, not 16. Couple more bobby pins for hold the bow in place and my head look like one Christmas present. Get one bag of orchids on top of the time clock. So before I grab my time card, I have to pick one orchid. The assistant manager said, take only one and pin it to my bowl so the flower look like it's behind my ear. Poor thing, those orchids. I'm night shift. So by the time I get to work, those orchids looking pretty tired already. Not their fault they wasn't born for me decoration at one wedding or in one of those fancy offices downtown. One time I had this customer. Could tell she was all into being in Waikiki. She had one flower behind her ear and one hot pink batik pareo with too much fringe, you know, the kind they make in Thailand. She take one look at my orchid and she tell me, I love it that everyone wears flowers in their hair. It must be so cool to pick a flower from your yard every day on your way to work. I tell her, I know more one yard. Mm -hmm. She look at me like I'm from Mars or something. Excuse me, she said, no more? That's when I realized she don't understand me. Happens all the time. Sorry, I don't have a yard, ma'am, I said. Could tell she was a little bit embarrassed, but she don't need to be shame. I know more one yard. I live in one apartment. Nobody I know get one yard. It is what it is. So I was wondering, she said, what side do I wear the flower if I'm single? I looked behind her at the long line of customers getting all antsy. Well, it's like your wedding ring, yeah, I tell her. Mm -hmm. You wear the flower on your left ear if you're married, just like you wear your wedding ring on your left hand. Oh my goodness, she said. She take the flower out from behind her right ear and shove them behind her left ear. Wouldn't want anyone to think I was single now, do I? She made like she all worried that every single guy in Waikiki is gonna mack on her in the next five minutes. I wanted to tell her, get real, this is McDonald's, it's not one disco. I wasn't trying to be mean or anything, but the truth is, I pulled that right ear, left ear answer straight out of my ass. 
<laughs> my mom always says, you got to think on your feet if you like being food services. My mom should know. She'd been on her feet for the past 15 years. Then the lady had a hard time keeping that flower behind her left ear. The thing kept slipping out. Here, I told her, I take the orchid out from my bowl and give her my bobby pin. And then she'd just look at me and then at the bobby pin. Oh, I appreciate it and all. But that thing was um, in your hair, she said. Now, I know you can use one bobby pin for do all kinds of stuff. Clean the wax out of your ear. Separate your eyelashes when they're all clumpy with mascara. Pick one lock. I went off with this lady, something for help her, keep her act together. But she couldn't see that. All she saw was one bobby pin that was stuck to my flat orange bowl. The thing never even touched my hair. Can I take your order? I asked her real robot kind. How about a strawberry shake, she said. Yeah, how about it? I say real sassy kind. And that's how I know you cannot see your reflection in the stainless steel equipment. I turned my face towards the side panel of the shake machine, and all I saw was blurry brown and orange. Ooh, man, that was so good. Thank you for asking. Oh, so <laughs> real, man. Oh, thank you, Anne. Oh, and, and I think a lot of people appreciate the language, you know, and also all of these issues that come up, yeah, when you have um, different experiences, you know, we're with people and, oh, so glad you wrote that. It's like one of my favorites. I, I have a lot of favorites, but oh, I love Bobby Pin. It's so good. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks for reading that. Oh, man. Well, thank you so much for coming you know, and sharing thanks your for inviting work. Me. No, and, and, and thanks for joining us. And also, I also wanted to say thank you for um, joining us um, in the reading room. And we would like to thank Lisa Lynn Kanai uh, for uh, visiting us here as well. And please join us for the next episode of The Reading Room. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs>